Good morning and welcome to our first service on Sunday mornings. We have two services, the first of which we devote to Bible prophecy. It's our weekly prophecy update. And second service, which will be live streamed at 1115 a.m. Hawaii time. We are going to begin our study in Philemon. We completed Titus in our verse by verse study through the Bible. And today's text is going to be verses 1 through 7 in a sermon that I've titled, Why is this in the Bible? Good question. Odd title, but good question. And we're going to answer that question. And we're so grateful for that and praise the Lord for that. All right, let's get started. (laughs) For today's update, I want to talk with you about the plan. Specifically, how the evil plan of man is actually and ultimately fulfilling the perfect prophetic plan of God. Now, please know that I know many are weary and discouraged, even fearful, concerning the future, certainly the uncertainty of the future and what the future holds. I spent more time in prayer this last week concerning today's update. And the sense I had was that today's update needed to be an encouragement. And I really do want to encourage you in the Lord with the encouragement that I myself have received from the Lord. And I have to say that I really don't know, and I I hope you hear my heart when I say this, but I really do not know, and I'll speak for myself chiefly, how any of us can possibly survive, let alone thrive, absent the Word of God and prayer were it not for God's Word and prayer, I doubt very much that I would even be standing here today before you, as is my privilege to do every week. Now, I know that whenever you talk about the Word of God and prayer, it sounds like a firm grasp of the obvious. But think about this. Is it not the source of faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Is it not also the source of our hope? Is it not also the source of our strength? It all comes vis-a-vis God's Word and prayer. So we're going to begin with the Word of God. And what I'm hoping to accomplish today is to place what I'll call biblical bookends, as it were, on the evil plan of man. So we'll start with God's plan for the evil plan of man. Then we'll look at this evil plan. And finally, how it's leading to and will be the fulfillment of God's glorious plan in the end. I am keenly aware, one last thing before we jump in, that there are those who would say, okay, I know this is God's plan in the end, but what about now? See, tomorrow morning that alarm clock is going to go off, and I'm going to go off to work assuming I still have a work to go to. What about now? I know God in the end is going to (laughs) have the final word, but I'm just trying to make it through the day, the week, the night. Doubtless you've heard it said, or you yourself have said, if I had only known then what I know now. 
you'll forgive me for what may seem like a play on words, but we can know now. We can know now what we wished we knew when we were going through what we were going through. God wants us to know now. And thankfully, God, as only He can, has told us in advance now what's coming in the end to steady us and to ready us now, in the now. Enter Isaiah 14. We studied this amazing chapter on Thursday night in our verse by verse trek through the Bible. We're currently in the book of Isaiah. We'd encourage you if you're able to come on Thursday night, seven o'clock. But in this chapter, God, through the prophet Isaiah, declares to God's people in advance His plan to judge evil in the end and bring an end to Satan himself. It is a, it's the burden of the Lord. In fact, from chapter 13 on through to Isaiah chapter 23, it's referred to as the book of burdens. Why burdens? Because of the heaviness, the weightiness of the coming judgment of God upon the nations surrounding Israel. But here's the thing. God does not have the prophet Isaiah declare this to the surrounding nations upon whom God's judgment will come. He has Isaiah the prophet declare this to God's people about what God's going to do to these surrounding enemy nations. Why? Because God wants His people to know, I'm going to take care of this. They're not going to get away with this. Just wait, you'll see. I love those four words. If you're with us on Thursday night, you love those four words too now, right? (laughs) It's actually Psalm 27, 13 and 14 where David writes, I would have lost heart. I would have lost hope. I would have given up. I almost did, were it not for my confidence in the goodness of the Lord. And it's so interesting because in these last two verses of Psalm 27, he basically has a talk with himself. This is different than self-talk. This is talking to self. I'm not losing it. Just stay with me here, okay? It's like David saying to himself, sit down, boy, we need to talk. He does it in Psalm 42 and 43 as well. Oh, my soul, why be in such despair? He's having a talk with himself. He's encouraging himself in the Lord. And he says to himself, be strong and wait. You'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Just wait, you'll see. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. I know (laughs) it's really bad. Would you agree that it's getting really real? Really real. It's getting real. I don't know how else to say it. And so God wanted Israel to know then, in advance, what He was going to do to settle them. I got this. I know what they're doing. I know the evil they are perpetrating. I'm going to take care of it. And not only that, (laughs) I'm also going to take care of the real enemy behind the evil, Satan himself. It almost looks like it's misplaced. Halfway through chapter 14 of Isaiah, all of a sudden, we're talking about Lucifer? Wait, what does that have to do with Babylon and then 
the Philistines and then Moabites and all of these surrounding nations. It's like he kind of breaks in and parenthetically prophesies about the end of Lucifer. Why? Because that's who's behind it all. That's the real enemy. That's the enemy behind Babylon, who we're going to, by the way, uh, see yet future. Well, we're not going to see it. I'm not going to be here to see it. You better not be here to see it either. (laughs) Revelation 17 and 18. But God wanted His people then, like He wants us as His people now, to know this now, because God is going to take care of it. God will have the final word. And here's how that plays out when your alarm clock goes off tomorrow morning. Knowing that now, what God will do, and oh, by the way, spoiler alert, He will do it. When God says it, He will do it. It will happen. Because God said it will happen. So it's going to happen. And I can't wait. (laughs) Just wait. You'll see. It's going to happen. But here's how that works in our lives now. It's like Jesus when He talks about and teaches this parable about two builders. And He says, one of them built his house on the sand, and the other built his house on the solid rock. So when, not if, the storm hit, adversity strikes, and adversity strikes. The house that's built on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, will stand immovable. And you know what's really interesting about this parable? It's so fascinating because there's a lot of similarities with these two builders in this parable. But the difference between the builder who built his house on the rock and the one who built his house on the sand, you know what the difference was? The one who built his house on the rock put into practice, applied, lived the Word of God. The Word. The other one apparently heard the Word, but didn't do it. He was a hearer, but not a doer. Big difference. And that made the difference. And this is why the Word of God and the God of the Word is of paramount importance in this day in which we are living. I say this, it's not hyperbole. I would literally go out of my mind. Some of you, too late. You already have, right? (laughs) I would lose my mind. I would go insane if I did not know the truth about how this is going to end. And that settles me. And it calms me. And it anchors me immovable on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 14, 12, God wants us to know this now. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, light bearer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Verses 15 and 16. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And this is interesting, verse 16. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? No way. There's going to be utter astonishment when we see this Lucifer in the end. On Thursday night we went more in depth into that, but I want to draw your attention to Ezekiel 28 verse 19, a parallel account of sorts. 
all the nations who knew you, speaking of Lucifer, are appalled at you. (laughs) You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. There is coming that day. I know it doesn't seem like it now, but it will come. Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who, listen very carefully, deceives, hang on to that, deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. If you were to ask me what I thought was the best go-to when it comes to evil, prospering seemingly with impunity, it would hands down be Psalm 73. Let me kind of give you the backstory of this psalm. The psalmist is having, and this is almost an understatement, having a crisis of faith. I mean, he is just flabbergasted as he sees the evil around him. And it seems like the wicked, the evil are getting away with the wicked and the evil. And here he is walking uprightly before the Lord in righteousness. And it's messing him up. It's so bad that he even says, I didn't want to even talk to the brethren because I didn't want to stumble them with my doubts. I'm riddled with doubt. I'm starting to question whether or not I've walked in righteousness in vain. For what? Everything I do is riddled with adversity and difficulty. And then here's my evil neighbor. Everything he does is prospered. And it's messing me up, man. What's up with this? That's a very loose paraphrase, but that's basically what he's struggling with. And he says in verses 2 and 3, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Here's why. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He's watching everything that's happening. He's looking at these wicked and evil men prosper in their ways, in their wickedness, in their evil. When you get to verse 16, this is very candid. He says, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. I I just (laughs) I could not wrap my mind around it. And truth be made known, I was losing my mind because of it. Until, verse 17, I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Oh, Uh, interesting. So the psalmist goes from envying them, (laughs) flabbergasted by them, to almost kind of feeling sorry for them, because this is how it ends for them. And it wasn't until He entered the sanctuary of the Lord. That alone is like God saying, I know, I know this is messing you up. Come here, I want to show you something. I'm going to show you the final scene on this one. I'm going to show you how it ends. And by the way, again, we we have it here. And that's a game changer, isn't it? You don't look at people the same anymore. 
instead of being angry with them, you have compassion for them because of how it ends for them. And that changes the whole complexion, doesn't it? It changes your heart and how you see people. And again, I hope you don't tire me saying this, but I know God's been doing a, a profound work in my heart in this regard. I don't look at people and say, oh, left, right, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, black, white. No. Either lost or saved. That's the bottom line. Either they know Jesus or they don't know Jesus. That's how you need to look at people. And when you see people that way, it changes everything. It changes your heart towards them, changes how you see them. One more thing here, and then we'll, we'll try to turn a corner. And maybe I just need to speak for myself and my own conviction before the Lord. But as I, as I see what's happening in the, in the world today, my, my heart is so heavy and so burdened and broken for people who don't know Jesus. I don't know how it's even possible. If I didn't know Jesus, I don't, well, again, I, I don't know. I just, I don't even know if I'd be alive. If I was alive, I'd probably be incarcerated. <laughs> Is that too much? <laughs> this is why at the end of the day, if I can say it that way, it's all about getting Jesus to people and people to Jesus as quickly as you possibly can, before it's too late. That's what it's all about. I wanted to start out this way because like with the psalmist, if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, we're prone to think that they're going to get away with this. You're not going to let them get away with this, are you, Lord? Because it like looks like you are. And then it's like the Lord saying, well, the, He says this to me. It's different for you, I'm sure. He says, come here, boy. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Sit down. I want to show you something. And I enter into the sanctuary of the Lord, and I see how God will deal with evil in the end. I'm settled. Okay, Lord. It's this settling understanding of their end in the end that will determine whether you or I live our lives full of fear or full of faith. That's the bottom line. If you're full of fear, you can't be full of faith. It's one or the other. It's then and only then that we can remain steadfast in our faith in the face of unspeakable evil. Evil, by the way, that was pre-planned by man and is now being perpetrated on man. If you'll kindly allow me to, I need to show you evidence of said plan, pre-planned many years ago. And in order to do that, we'll at this time end the live stream and redirect you to the website if you're not already there. 
pictured here is an October 2017 publication, 2017, from the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, bearing the title, SPARS Pandemic, 2025 to 2028, a futuristic scenario for public health risk communications. The preface, very telling. It lays out a social media scenario with the heading, possible future in 2025, the echo chamber. Listen to these quotes. Ultimately, a world comprised of isolated and highly fragmented communities with widespread access to information technology dubbed the echo chamber was selected as the future in which the prospective scenario would take place. In the year 2025, the world has become simultaneously more connected, yet more divided. However, many have chosen to self-restrict the sources they turn to for information, often electing to interact only with those with whom they agree. This trend has increasingly isolated cliques from one another, making communication across and between these groups more and more difficult. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and other public health agencies have increasingly adopted a diverse range of social media technologies, including long Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter, as well as emerging platforms like ZapQ, a platform that enables users to aggregate and archive selected media content from other platforms and communicate with cloud-based social groups based on common interests and current events. <laughs> 2017. When you get to chapter one, titled, The Spars Outbreak Begins, they state, and I quote, in mid-October 2025, three deaths were reported among members of the First Baptist Church of St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, how convenient. Two of the church members had recently returned from a missionary trip to the Philippines. The third was the mother of a church member who had also traveled to the Philippines with the church group. Are you with me on this? Are you hearing this? Are, are you getting this? We're going to control the narrative on social media. We're actually going to tag everything you post, and we're going to fact check. Sorry. <laughs> and we're going to censor and silence. Why? Because of the lie. And so we're going to redirect social media to the narrative that we want you to believe. That's what this is. And that's what they're doing. And this is a script. And it's happening exactly like they planned it to happen. When you get to the end of the chapter, they have a section titled, Communication Dilemma. And they pose the following questions. Number one, 
how can health authorities best meet public demands for critical information, such as, what is the health threat? And what do I know about it when the crisis is still unfolding and not all the facts are known? Number two, what benefits does monitoring trends in social media, stop right there, monitoring? (laughs) You're not just monitoring, you're scrubbing, you're silencing, you're censoring, you're removing social media posting. What benefits does monitoring trends in social media postings confer on efforts to meet people's information needs during an evolving health crisis? 2017, what were you doing in 2017? Yeah, the whole year. What were you doing the whole year in 2017? This is what they were doing, and this is what they were planning. Number three, what medical and morale boosting purposes does sharing information about self-protective actions serve for the public during an uncertain and fear instilling situation? It's important to note that this was published subsequent to scenarios for the future of technology and international development from none other than the Rockefeller Foundation and Global Business Network seven years prior, back in May of 2010. In this future scenario, they simulate a global pandemic, 2010, stating, and I quote, in 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. We were anticipating? Oh yeah. You know why? Because we pre-programmed this into all the movies you flocked to the theaters to watch. We pre-programmed it in your kids' cartoons when you shoved them in front of the TV. And we started doing this ah, long time ago. We, we actually programmed you to anticipate what we were going to do to you. Have a nice afternoon. This reads again like a movie script, because it is. And when you get to the chapter titled Lockstep, a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback, you would think that you were watching the news in May of 2021, 11 years later. Because it's exactly what's happened. And we talked about this prior down to the face masks and the social distancing and the travel restrictions and the lockdowns and the surveillance and the digital biometric IDs. It's all here. It's all here. That's their plan. That's their plan. Okay, I'm going to try to not have an asthma attack right now. actually for real. (laughs) If I start wheezing, you'll know. (laughs) Get my rescue inhaler. (laughs) That was seven years prior in 2010. Two years later, we've talked about this as well, 2019. The aforementioned Johns Hopkins, along with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation conducted Event 201, which was a high-level pandemic exercise simulating a global outbreak, modeling what they called a fictional coronavirus. Now, 
October, let's, let's just bear with me. Let's, October 2019. Hmm. And then it happened, uh, what, a couple months later? Things that make you go, hmm. If this weren't bad enough, on July 9th of this year, this is my birthday. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> the World Economic Forum for my birthday <laughs> will stage their annual cyber attack exercise as it continues to prep for a potential cyber pandemic that founder Klaus Schwab says will be worse than the current global crisis. Oh, thanks for the heads up. So this is what you got planned. So you got the SPARS pandemic. What a coincidence. <laughs> 2025, 2028. That's interesting by itself. And then uh, July 2021, you're going to simulate a cyber pandemic. Well, let's see. This is May, June. Well, I got a couple months. So this is going to happen this year, 2021. 20 years ago, in June of the year 2001, did you know that they had a planned exercise called Operation Dark Winter? Do you know what it was? It was a simulation of a bioterrorist smallpox virus attack, 2001. More specifically, the U.S. government's response using military force. It should be noted that on the cover it states, this is the property of Johns Hopkins Center for Civilian Biodefense Center for Strategic and International Studies. Here's a quote from page eight. Each and every one of the 3.5 million citizens of Oklahoma will receive the smallpox vaccine in the next 72 hours. I think it's important we reassure people that the government is going to take care of them. <laughs> wow. This is from page 28. Before committing U.S. troops, the president must issue a proclamation for rebellious citizens to disperse, cease, and desist. Martial law depends for its justification upon public necessity. Necessity gives rise to its creation. Necessity justifies its exercise, and necessity limits its duration. The extent of the military force used and the actual measures taken consequently will depend upon the actual threat, listen, to order and public safety, which exists at the time. The president normally announces his decision by a proclamation which should detail the substance of the martial rule. Listen to this quote from page 32. Situation briefing, status of epidemic, slide six. Dangerous misinformation in some media reports of good vaccine, bad vaccine. And get this, quoting, hate speech targeting certain ethnic groups. How did they know? Because they planned it, and then they executed the plan. That's how. Here's what we're going to do. And we did it. 
I mean, that's the... That's the uh, <sighs> You know what I find interesting is this veiled mention of social media as, quote, dangerous misinformation in some media. Oh, how did they know? I mean, neither social media nor their propaganda of misinformation existed in 2001. And it's evidenced by this future marketing website showing a timeline of the history of social media. YouTube did not come until 2005, four years later. Facebook was not open to the public until 2006, five years later. Twitter followed as well. And again, all of them were four, five years after Operation Dark Winter, which was two months approximately before 9-11. Hmm. You know what's not talked about very much? Is the anthrax that ensued. Do you know what that was about? That was about everything that is happening now. Here's where I'm going with all this. The common denominator is that they're all pre-planned plans to manufacture a crisis. It's textbook Hegelian dialectic. First, create the crisis, then control the reaction. I think it was Lenin who was quoted as saying, the only way to control the opposition is to lead it. So create the crisis, control the opposition, then execute the pre-planned final solution. The problem is that said final solution is the demonic deception that God in His Word has detailed for us in the pages of Bible prophecy. I'd like to draw your attention to Revelation chapter 18, verse 23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. This is the prophecy concerning Babylon, and it comports with Isaiah 14, which was a dual prophecy concerning Babylon then, and yet future prophetically the Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. It's actually two Babylons. It's commercial Babylon and religious Babylon. The voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, every nation, by your sorcery. Revelation 9 verse 21. And they did not repent of their murders or their here it is again, sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Why do I highlight and emphasize sorceries? Because in the original language of the Greek New Testament, the word sorcery is where we get our English word for pharma. It's actually in the Greek pharmakia, where we get pharmacy, pharmaceuticals, so let's, let's revisit now these prophecies concerning the deception of these sorceries. In other words, there will be a deception. All of the nations on earth will be deceived by some pharmaceutical deception. And if you only understood 
the implications of this, because it carries with it the idea of a magic potion, a poison that was used in ritual with witchcraft and satanic magic arts. That's what this is. Man, I take a lot of heat for this, but whatever, bring it on. Thank you. All you ever do, JD, is talk about the vaccine every week. (laughs) You know, and the Lord knows my heart on this. I truly believe and I'm becoming increasingly convinced that it will be a pharmaceutical in the form of a vaccine, in some form, that will become the mark of the beast during the seven-year tribulation after the rapture of the church, which has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. Revelation 16, 2. This is one of several reasons that I am becoming increasingly convinced that it is a pharmaceutical vaccine in some form. There will be this horrific medical reaction to whatever it is. Revelation 16, 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. That sounds like a medical reaction to a pharmaceutical to me. Doesn't it sound like that to you too? That's just one. Another reason I believe it is, is because there will come that time, and I believe it's sooner than anyone realizes, where you will not be able to do anything if you have not been vaccinated. Oh, you want to go to the store and get some food? You cannot. Uh, actually, your, your social credit score is too low. And actually, you can't even leave the house. You can't do anything. How do we know? Oh, we know. Because we've tracked you. We know everything about you. We know exactly where you're at, not just in your home, but what room you're in in your home, and what chair you're sitting in in your home. And oh, by the way, (laughs) we know about that argument you have with your wife, because we listen to everything you say. Don't look at me like that. We've talked about this before. There are other reasons. And that's enough of that. Let's talk about God's plan. But God. Please listen to me as I say this, because it's very important. God not only planned on the evil pre-planned plan of man, He's allowing it. And He's using it to bring about the salvation of many this day. God, who sees the end from the beginning, in His omniscience, foreknew all of this, and foretold all of this. Replete, 
throughout the pages of Holy Writ, we see the evil of man bringing glory to God. The plan of man is meant for evil, but God works it for good as only He can. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Genesis 50, 20. Joseph to his brothers, <laughs> who did unspeakable evil to him. Now they realize that this is their brother that they had thought was long ago dead. And now he's the most powerful man in the world, save Pharaoh. And they are terrified, because all Joseph has to do is, he doesn't have to do that, just the eyebrow. He just does the eyebrow. That's it. Off with their head. Just, you're done. And they knew it. And what does he say to them? He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God, I love those two words, meant it for good in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. God allowed you to do that to me. God, you, you thought you were so clever. Your plans, oh wow, so clever your plans. You couldn't, God let you do it because ultimately it fulfilled His plan in the end. Right. You thought you were, ah, yeah. we talked about this Thursday night, I better be careful, otherwise I'll preach Thursday night's sermon. But it's like God just laughs. It's kind of like, I, I really want to know what that laugh sounds like. The devil is God's devil. He is a created being. He is not the opposite of God. And he cannot do anything to us unless God allows him to. Ask Job. Ask Peter. <laughs> actually, don't ask Peter. <laughs> I feel so bad for Peter because Jesus actually tells him about it. He says, Peter, I, come here. I, I, gotta, I need to talk with you. What? What, Lord? Well, <clears throat> the other day Satan came to me and he asked for permission to sift you as wheat. <laughs> it's not in the text, but if I'm Peter, I'm like, <laughs> you told him no, right, Lord? <laughs> Actually, no, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I, I told him yes. You Why? Because it will be for your good and my glory in the end. You know, when we were studying through the book of Job, which was a wow, just a wow. That's the only other word I can come up with. What a book, my goodness. But right at the beginning, it is so fascinating because Satan had to ask for permission before he could do anything. And God gave him permission. And it's very interesting that, that Satan did up to the very point where God said, you can do that, but you can't do that. And the only reason I'm going to let you do this to my servant Job is because it's going to fulfill my purpose in the end. And that's the only reason God will allow the enemy to do anything in our lives. It is ultimately for His glory and our good. I love Psalm 76.10. It says, surely, surely, with a certainty, the wrath of man shall praise you. You'll make the evil of man, the wrath of man, to praise you and glorify you with the remainder of wrath. You shall gird yourself. This is the other bookend. God not only has a plan for the evil of man, knowing His plan, He has a final plan of salvation for man. And that's the good news. 
the gospel. The good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians in chapter 15, the first four verses, says that the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus came and He died for us. He was crucified. He was buried. But He rose again on the third day. And the first time the Apostle Paul ever writes the gospel is to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians. And he says, Jesus came, He was crucified, buried, rose again on the third day, and good news, He's coming back again one day. That's the gospel. I mean, it's, it's not just He died, He was buried, and then He rose again. Now it's up to you. He did His part. Good news. Well, <laughs> wait, that's not the, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. He rose again from the dead, defeating death. And He said, He promised, and He cannot break a promise. He gave us His Word, and He cannot go back on His Word. He said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you see, in my Father's house are many mansions. Oh, if He could just see the mansion I'm preparing for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you can be also. And I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Lord, come back. <laughs> now would be a very good time, Lord. That's the good news, the gospel. For the last couple, three years now, we've been doing the childlike, simple ABCs of salvation, which is just really a simple explanation of salvation. And the A is for admit or acknowledge that you've sinned, that you need the Savior. This is Romans 3.10. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. And Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were all born sinners, which is why Jesus said we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 is interesting because it sort of packages the bad news first with the good news. The bad news the wages of sin is death. And we just got done hearing that we've all sinned. So that means all of us have been sentenced to death. That's the bad news. Now here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift that is given. Someone had to pay for that gift. If you pay for it, it's not a gift, it's a purchase. No, He paid for it in full. Cost Him everything. His blood shed in our stead. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will, key word, be saved. The jury is no longer out. The verdict is in. You will be saved. And the C, lastly, is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And Romans 10, 13 seals the deal. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to close with a testimony from an online member about a very creative way to use 
the ABCs of salvation. And I picked this particular one for a reason. I want to share that reason with you. Dear J.D., I wanted to share with you how amazing the Lord is working in the lives of people right now. We have been sharing your online updates with our small group, Prophecy Update Group, every week since 2015. We call ourselves Puggers. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Since you started sharing the ABCs of salvation, our oldest daughter has become interested in listening to your updates in the last year. Here's the cool thing. It hasn't always been this way. Long story short, I met my husband when the kids were only three and five years old. He had been previously married, but due to the divorce, he was unable to raise them consistently in a Christian home. But God, in His mercy and grace, has been so good to our family. In 2019, our oldest daughter gave birth to her son a few weeks early, and her son had to be in the NICU for a few weeks. Her son is 19 months old now, and he's healthy and well. Our daughter has seen the Lord's faithfulness as she had turned to Him during this very hard time. Then COVID happened, and she has been very in tuned to how the world is responding to all the division and challenges. Recently, she has been posting your updates on her Facebook page. How amazing is that? So I wanted to share with you how she was led to print up the ABCs of salvation. Her idea is to tape them in the restroom bathroom stall doors. Oh wait, <laughs> yeah, while customers and employees use the restroom. What else are they going to do when they're sitting there? But read the ABCs of salvation. I thought that is a great idea. And I asked her to print me out a copy so I could do the same thing. I have had this printout for six months now, and I fa finally made a few copies of it today. I have sent her a picture of my first taped bathroom stall ministry, <laughs> the ABCs of salvation. I told her I did this today, and I pray she gets responses as she has directed anyone with questions. This is really good, to an email address that will go to her. I'm excited to see the Lord work in this, but I already know He has. Because according to Genesis 50.20, this was sent to me before I did my, uh, and prepared my uh, update, Genesis 50.20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Maranatha. And may we keep giving this lost world hope. The hope of Jesus, your sister in Christ, Susan. Please stand. I want to share with you, lastly, I haven't done one last thing yet, right? So this will be the last thing. We'll have the worship team come up. The reason I selected this particular testimony is because 39 years ago now, I entered into, I know this is TMI, but I entered into a public restroom. And I entered into the stall. And there was a gospel tract. And on it were the words, how to be saved. I thought, okay, well, how to be saved, okay. So I read it, and I was very impacted by it. And I took it, and I saved it. And get this, it was nine months later. It was almost like that was when the conception took place the seed of God's Word, and it began to germinate in that gestation period. And then nine months later, I was born again. Because of that 
bathroom stall tract. And so, yeah, yeah. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of the gospel to save. God's Word does not return void. You just never know. And, and God is actually protecting you. I was just sharing with uh, Pastor Mac before first service. We were just talking about all the things that God is doing. And I made this comment to him about a Oswald Chambers quote that I heard many years ago that stuck with. This will be the last, last thing. Okay. <laughs> and, it, and it goes something like this. Oftentimes God will deem it necessary to not let you know how much He's used you in the life of another. It's to protect you from you, so you don't think it's you. Right? So get this, we have no idea how God has used us in the life of another, but there's coming a time in glory. Oh, all the people that we bring with us, all of those people that we had an impact on for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. I thank you that you choose and use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak to shame the strong, so that you alone are the recipient of all the glory. No flesh is going to glory in your presence, Lord. Lord, I thank you for Bible prophecy, for telling us now so we can know now how it's going to end, so we can be settled in you. Lord, I pray for anyone who does not know you. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that nothing would keep them away from making the most important decision of their life for eternal life. And lastly, <laughs> Lord Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.